The book of Romans chapter number five. Blessing to be with you and thank God for his goodness in this day to us and for his blessings upon us. And we uh, continue on preaching and praying and inviting and just telling folk about Jesus and that's what we do. And you never know what the Lord has in store for us uh, day by day. And when we rise in the mornings, we commit our souls unto him and uh, ask him for divine direction and leadership and guidance in all matters. All right, let's stand, if you will, please, and we'll reverence God's word together in his reading. Looking in Romans chapter number five and verse number one, it says, Therefore... Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'll ask you to do me a favor, and let's read this publicly together. As you look there in your scripture, let's read it together. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we ask you to give us grace and strength to preach it. Lord, minister to this congregation and however this message goes out, whether it be here or whether it be by, uh, by way of the digital world, I pray the Holy Ghost will accompany your word. For you said you send it forth and it would accomplish that which you send it forth to do. Lord, we know it's never in vain when the word of God is preached. And I pray you administer to every heart now. You know our needs. We commit it unto thee, Father. Lord, bless all the seed that's been sown today. Various means, various ways, and God may somehow germinate in hearts and may it bring forth fruit to your glory. Our eyes are upon you, Lord. Nothing of ourselves, but all in thee. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I love to hear God's congregation read the Word of God publicly. That way you have confidence that the preacher is not just preaching his thoughts or something that he's come up with, but right there in your lap, you have an open Bible. And it's a blessing to see all these open Bibles. Now, a lot of religions don't want you to have an open Bible because that Bible contradicts everything they believe and everything they say. But you and I tonight, we open our Bible, we read the Word of God, and we know that that foundation of the Scripture is greater than what any man could say. And the privilege to preach is given the command to preach the Word. Not preach about preaching the Word, but preach the Word in and of itself. And I am fully persuaded that this is the inspired Word of God it's not all that God knows, but it is what God wants us to know. And there are a lot of things we don't understand in the Bible, but it's like one fellow told another guy, he said, it's not what I don't understand that bothers me, it's what I do understand that really affects me. I'm glad there are things that are plain and clear as can be, and there's no argument, there's no wrangling with it. And this is one of those verses. Now, it opens up by saying, therefore... The book of Romans is divided into different sections, and each section begins with the word therefore. This book of Romans has often been called God's law book. It's been called the courtroom drama of redemption. And it is laid out in a manner in which you would bring forth a, a evidence before a judge and a jury and a congregation there. And it's like he gives one layer of truth and then he says, because of this, therefore. And he begins another layer of truth. And after he's established those facts, then he said, therefore. And he goes to another level of truth. Well, we're all the way over into chapter number five. And he opens up by saying, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are two things that have to be established. Number one, that there is a God. For if there is no God, why do we have to worry about peace with somebody that does not exist? It's amazing in our society how people are angry when God is brought up as the subject matter. 
For instance, the final four of the women's basketball, South Carolina won. The coach is just rejoicing and having a big time. And uh, she says, you know, I believe in God. God's been good to us, been, been gracious to us. They have devotions before uh, every practice and every game. And she said, if you don't believe in God, I don't understand why you don't believe in God. Well, uh, the atheists have already brought a lawsuit against the University of South Carolina saying she's mixing religion and uh, public education and she ought to be fired. Now, my question is this. If, you say, if I say to you, I believe in Mickey Mouse, you're going to look at me like, are you an idiot? Mickey Mouse is going to send you to hell. What? Are you crazy? If I don't really believe in that fictional character, why in the world would I get angry if somebody else does? But you know, when God's name is mentioned, the atheists that's like and infidels that claim there is no God suddenly get mad about the fact that somebody has mentioned there is a God. So that's the first uh, thing that needs to be established. Number two, second thing is, if there is a God, then man is out of fellowship with him and there is no peace, there is a war, there is a breach between man and God. Look back in Romans chapter number one. These two truths have already been established in the very first chapter of the book of Romans. He says there in chapter number one and uh, verse number 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So we see because God is a holy God, and man is unrighteous, he's unlike God, he's ungodly, he's unholy. He has sinned and come short of the glory of God. As a result, the wrath of God, God hangs over his head. Now, the Lord says in verse number 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. The Lord's uncovering the secrets of men's hearts. Billy Sunday used to say, you old sinner, you, the reason you don't like the word of God is because it knows all about you. <laughs> oh, you can put on your face, you can put on your facade and pretense and all that, but the word of God is a sword that's quick and powerful and sharper than any sword man could ever produce. And it is a discerner between thoughts and intents of the heart, goes between the joints and the mire and it uncovers all the wickedness of men. And in verse number 19, the Lord said, I have done something for men. I have manifested myself in their conscience and showed it unto them, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Now that light that lighteth all men that came into the world, uh, somewhere in the back of every man's mind, there is a conscience. That conscience is a Latin word which means a guide. And uh, you say, well, I trust my conscience. You can't really do that because your conscience may be seared or it may be reprobated or it may be pushed back so far that it cannot give you that truth that needs to be given to you. But you see, my friend, in the back of every man's mind, there is something that says, yes, there is a God. And you don't even have to know the Bible or hear preaching to understand that. I preached in the deep, dark jungles of Brazil and the plains of Africa. And I've been in many parts of the world where folk would call them heathens. But you know, everywhere I go, they have got idols. They've got gods they've carved out by the Akamba tribe. Uh, they've got spirits. They've got things that they worship as God. They know there's some sort of God, they just don't know how to get to them. Uh, Dan Truax, a teacher of mine in mission, said he went to Africa, went to a village that had never heard the gospel. He sat down with the chief and all the men around the fire. And he asked the chief this question, do you know there's a God? He said, yes, we know there's a God. He said, how do you know? He said, well, ask him. And the fellow said, we know there's a God because somebody makes the sun rise in the east and set in the west every day. He said, we know there's a God because somebody gives us the early and the latter rains. 
And they do by nature that which is written in the law of God. They know it's wrong to kill their neighbor. They know it's wrong to rob and steal and all that. And unless their conscience is seared or reprobated, uh, then they'll continue to do that and it gets worse and worse till they don't even feel any sorrow or any remorse over it whatsoever. And if you don't believe that, you can listen to the 911 tapes that came out whenever the Twin Towers fell and listen to the people talking to the dispatcher. And they're screaming and crying out. And they're saying, Oh my, Darwin, help us. No. Oh my, Mother Monkey. No. Oh my, and then whose name do they use? It's God. Somebody's going to have a head-on collision and here comes that Mack truck in front of and they grab that steering wheel and without even thinking it blurts out, oh my, and they use whose name? God, because it's in the back of their mind. And the Lord said, I put something in them to show them that there is a God. Now that's not salvation, but that is an evidence that there is a God. Then number two, look in verse 20. He says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The Lord said, I have put my fingerprints and my signature on creation to the degree that it is clearly seen that there is a God of eternal power to do what's done in order for there to be a creation that we enjoy. It's mind-boggling at the billions of dollars National Geographic has spent to travel around the world and go to the depths of the ocean and the height of the mountains and uh, the breadth of the deserts and to go into all the regions of the world and explore the caves and explore nature and all of that and then come out When they see all of this and then say, well, 40 million billion years ago, this happened, like who was around 40 million billion years ago? I was preaching at uh, Fountain Square in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio one time. And uh, as I walked up, I had a Bible and some tracts and gave this lady a tract. She said, oh, you're a Bible thumper, are you? I said, ma'am, I'm a gospel preacher. She said, well... I believe in the million, billion year theory of evolution. I said, well, ma'am, was anybody around when all that's supposed to happen? She said, "Uh, no, of course not. It's a theory. I took my Bible and I said, "Uh, if you ever get a notion to read this book, you're going to have some wonderful reading. But as you go through it, you're going to come to a big, long list of names over in Chronicles. Names that a Hebrew scholar can't hardly even pronounce. You'll finally get through that and get some more real interested reading. And then if you get through the Old Testament, you'll come to the New. And you'll run into another long list of names. And you'll go a little further and you'll have another long list of names. I said, do you know what that's about? She said, what? I said, that is people that were alive and they have seen with their very own eyes and testify of God and what God has done. All you're doing is looking back in the smoke screen of some professor's mind and saying, well, this may be how it was. God wrote it down in his Bible to say this is how it is. Creation declares there is a God. And if you can look at a brilliant sunset and a sunrise and and all that's going on, but we've got a crowd today that uh, they think they're in charge. And so they want to tax all you ladies that you use hairspray for blowing a hole in the ozone layer that's going to suck us all out of here. Al Gore was given a billion dollar check by a New Zealander to promote global warming and to get rid of all the carbon footprints. And so he's taken his jet and left carbon footprints all over the world, built him a 70 bedroom house Uh, kicked his old wife out and married him a young gal and he's been promoting global warming ever since and it's nothing more than a big hoax. And they look at all this and say, well, man's in charge of it. You look at that eclipse and ask me, did man cause that? Did man do that? Absolutely not. Our God is the God of creation and throughout the Bible you'll see the Lord 
uh, receiving the glory for his creation, and that creation tells us there is a God. I had a Frenchman that came and stayed with me three weeks in the mountains of western North Carolina where I live. I took him all over the place, to Clingman's Dome, to Mount Mitchell. I took him uh, to the different places of beauty around our area. And after three weeks of traveling and allowing him to see all that, I asked David, and he spoke clear English. I said, well, what did you think about this part of the world? He said, well, I was raised in Paris and said I grew up looking at concrete streets and buildings and everything was humanism and everything was man. But he said, when I step out on your front porch and I look out over these Blue Ridge Mountains, it screams at me, there is a God, there is a God, there is a God. And to behold that, God said it is clearly imprinted and clearly seen by creation that there is a God. And a man has to be very dishonest to come to any other conclusion. On a bus out of Moscow, Russia, leaving there, having preached, going to Kostroma, which is north up the Volga River, we took an all-night bus ride, and sitting beside me was Sergei, a Russian translator who was lost. I started witnessing to him, as I always did, and Sergei looked at me and said, Man... Our schools have taught us, and I believe in the million, billion year theory of the Big Bang and the evolution and all that. I said, Sergey, do you know what a Jaguar sports car is? He said, I do. I said, you know the low profile tires, the high horsepower engine, the beautiful paint jobs, the leather interiors, all of that, and the sophistication of it. I said, he said yes, I know. I said, do you know where they came from? He said, where? I said, 40 million years ago, there was an explosion in an automobile factory and it blew out Jaguar sports cars of all makes, models, shapes, and kind. He looked at me and said, are you crazy? I said, you think I'm crazy? I look at your eyes and see the ability for you to read a page and see stars light years away. I look at your ears that are able to receive uh, vibrations and signals that go through your eardrum, be transmitted to the gray matter between your eyes and and give to you the reasoning and understanding of what I'm conveying to you. When I look at your hand with greater ability than any mechanical apparatus to reach down and pick up fine things or hold strong things, when I study your circulatory system, your nervous system, when I see your heart that pumps faithfully many people for well over a hundred years and never skips a beat, and I think about your ability to taste and, and all of the senses that you have, and you want me to look at that and say, oh, that just came out of a big blowout by chance. He said, oh, you're oversimplifying things. I said, no, you're making things too complex. But the reason they come up with this, if there is no God, then we're our own God and we can do what we want to do and there is no accountability before God. Connie Chung went into the prison and interviewed Jeffrey Dahmer, who was a serial killer and became a cannibal. They arrested him. They put him in prison. They gave him a sentence to die. And she's interviewing and wanted to know what this serial killer was all about. She had her ABC crew in there, and they're taping this, and I've got the tape at home. And she asked him, why, what? He said, well, I grew up as a young man. said, we got into uh, the back alleys and trash bins and found pornography that had been laying aside. Then uh, we began to get violent and I joined a gang and uh, it had, we had to kill some people and then I liked it and then it just got worse and worse. And I learned in public school, they said I came out of slime and I was going to slime. So I said, why not live like slime? And I became a law unto myself. He said, however, ma'am, since I've been in prison, there have been some men came by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I realize that all that's wrong and that I am a sinner and that I deserve to go to hell. But Jesus died for me and I've trusted him. As He said, if you cut that camera off, I'll not give you one more word of interview. And he showed her and she was trembling. 
Not because she was interviewing a serial killer, but because she was interviewing a man that was telling her she needed to repent or she's going to wind up in hell. And that he had got saved and the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed him from all sin. And he scared her to death. And that truth causes a lot of people to tremble knowing that if there is a God, then I'm in trouble with God. And the Lord tells us why men are in trouble with God. Look in Romans chapter number 1, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. And their foolish heart was dark. And instead of getting evidence, there's a God. Well, if there's a God, then I need to know Him. And whatever it takes, I want to know Him. No, 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 no. I'm going to figure it out myself. They become vain in their imagination. And verse 22, professed themselves to be wise. They became fools. We've got a lot of professors that are fools teaching foolish things down here at the universities. You can spend a lot of money and go three or four years and graduate, but I'm going to give you the abbreviated version of what they want to teach. They teach young people way back yonder, nobody knows where, nobody knows why, nobody knows when, nobody knows who, nobody knows what, nobody knows how. But all big nothingness jumped together with such fury that there was an explosion called Big Bang. And by the luck of the draw, there was a squiggly amoeba that rode a fiery meteorite down through the universe and got bucked off in the Atlantic Ocean like a bunk buster trying to ride a horse. Now they don't tell you where the Atlantic Ocean came from, but anyhow, this little amoeba, it begins to squiggle around and it begins to change and evolve. It becomes a little guppy and then a shrimp. Then it bleeps into a bigger fish and a bigger fish and finally into a flying fish. And then he swells up and gets big like a whale and beaches up on the, on the beach and uh, chasing something. But then he says, I'm too fat. So he shrinks down, becomes an iguana lizard, crawls out, crawls around. And uh, then he blips into a possum because he said, I need a fur coat because it's getting cold around here. He hops around like a kangaroo and then he decides his tail's too long and said he needs a skinnier tail and he becomes a little spider monkey. Then he blips into a chimpanzee and then he beats his chest one day and says I'll be a gorilla and he goes up a, a coconut tree, reaches out to get a coconut, falls, hits his head on a rock, puts on a suit and tie and marches right over here to Kansas State University, gets him a job teaching evolution. Now that's the abbreviated form. Oh, they can mix it up with all their jargon and all their big words and all their lying documents, but basically that's what they believe. God said, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And then once they become fools, they start running on the platform of change. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made light unto a corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. It talks about they're going to worship something. Man innately wants to worship. And there are all kind of gods that men make. A priest in India, I've been over there 23 times and seen the gods and goddesses of every kind. They got three million of them. You can see the gods and goddesses that are all over the world that men worship and create and they make. But you know what? In America, we've got a lot of mental gods. And a mental god is as bad as a metal god. A god of men's own imagination and a god of their own thinking and how they invent. When I got saved, I came to the Word of God and I said, I'm going to take the Bible as it teaches God is. Not the kind of God I think I want or the kind of God that I want him to be. But God reveals himself in the word, and you just worship him. You don't change him. He is the unchangeable God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we don't change him. But then God said when they start all this change in business, God gave them up to uncleanliness. They dishonor their own bodies. They turn the truth of God into a lie, worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. They start perverting that which God has put forth in truth. And then God said for this cause, He gave them the vile affection. 
For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, likewise the men. And the Bible says then the conclusion of this is they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. No God for me. God said, I gave them up to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You say, why do, why do people do the things that they do? Here's why. Because they're living in a state of sin, fear with unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters inventors of evil think disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and unmerciful. And God gives a description of what lost men do. And if you don't know anything about God or the Bible, you have to admit there's something wrong with the human race. In the sound of our ears last night, sirens went off. They went to a shooting just right down the road. You listen to the police report. There's abuse, there's robbery, there's rape, there's uh, stealing and all these things. And you wonder why people do that. It's because they're rejecting God and they're living a life of sin. Well, he talks about unrighteousness. There's no peace between man and God. There's a war going on. But then in chapter number two, he talks about self-righteousness. Here's a religious man that says, yeah, that's right, all these unrighteous folk, they deserve judgment. But me, me, I think I'm better than them. And God said, uh, do you think judging somebody else is going to make you righteous? You'll hear them say, oh, we ought to drop a big bomb over there in Mecca and kill all of them. Let's go down here to the bar and get us a beer and talk about it. Yeah, and they'll go home and abuse their family and steal and rob and all that, but they're better than all that other crowd. Uh, but God said this, look in chapter number three and in verse number nine. What well, then are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we prove both Jew and Gentile, they're all under sin. And as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. And by the way, that's the only nuns the Bible knows anything about. There's four of them there. None righteous. None that understand. None that seeketh after God. None that doeth good. No, not one. Not you, not me, not anybody else. And in verse 17, he said, the way of peace they have not known. That's the way of sin. And the way of sin brings a breach between man and God. Well, people say, well, I'll fix that myself by trying to keep some laws and my good outweighing my bads. I know I've done a lot of bad, but maybe I can do something good, rescue somebody or give grandma a load of firewood or help a little widow across the street. I, I can do something. Maybe God will understand well. Verse 19 said, We know that what things serve the law saith it said to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Oh, if I can just get religious, I'll fix that. God said no amount of law keeping and religion can fix it. But I'm glad it doesn't end there. Man has no peace with God. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. He says even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ. We've sung it in two different songs tonight. How our righteousness comes through what Jesus did upon the cross. Amen. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But now he says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption means to pay the price. And because he paid the price by dying upon the cross, it's through the grace of God and by faith in him. God set him forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. The blood of Christ can save 10 million worlds as wicked as this world. 
but it will not wash away one sin of one man unless he follows, verse 25, propitiation through faith in his blood. If you do not have faith in Him and trusting in Him and His blood, the anger and the wrath of God abides over you. The Bible says, He that believeth not is condemned already. You're not going to be condemned. You're already condemned. And the only way to be brought out from under that condemnation is by faith in His blood. And as a result, God declares His righteousness for the remission of our sins. And he washes away our sins by his precious blood. Oh, thank God for this glorious gospel declaring his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. God is a holy God. He's a righteous God. It's already been proved and shown. And he can't just look at you and say, oh, I like you pretty good. You've done a few good things. I love you. So let's, let's just forget about your sins. You know, no, Don't worry about it. No, His holiness will not allow that. But His holiness says, if you'll trust my son who I bruised upon the cross, who I poured my judgment out upon the cross of Calvary, if you'll trust Him, then on those grounds I will make a contract with you that I will impute to you His righteousness and your sins can be washed away for time and eternity through faith in His precious blood. Amen. Amen. Now the breach is gone. The wrath is taken care of. And through the blood of Jesus, guess what? I now have peace with God. Back over to our text, verse number 1 of chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. No faith in Him, no justification. No justification, no peace with God. Religion keeps trying to establish its own merit, its own standing before God, the gospel says Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. The gospel says there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Do you have peace with God? Do you know everything's clear between you and your maker, between you and the eternal God of glory? If he calls you home right now and you have to stand before God, do you know that you stand in peace with God? Not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus Christ did. He is our advocate. He is our mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And I worship him tonight right here in Kansas and say thanks be unto God who set forth his son to be the propitiation through faith in his blood declaring his righteousness for the forgiveness of my sins. Are you saved? Are you sure you're saved? Are you putting all your stock? Are you putting all your trust? Are you repenting of unrighteousness and self-righteousness and laying hold on the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord? And if not, I'd do that. If so, I believe we ought to be worshiping God and thanking Him that He provided such a gospel and such a median and a means of justification through faith in His blood. Let's stand all over the house. If you'll come with a number, please. We'll sing a number invitation tonight.